Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our seminar today. So this week we are continuing a bit on the side of, uh, I mean, the topic that, that was discussed last week. So it will be again about quantum hardware, not about quantum, like abstract quantum information, but about actual quantum hardware. So uh, we have a pleasure to host uh, Damian Kwiatkowski from Institute of Physics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Damian is a, as we have, I mean, as Polish speaker just heard now, like a finishing PhD student of uh, Łukasz Cywiński from, from Institute of Physics. And the topic of, uh, of the talk of uh, Damian is, uh, well, uh, how, uh, to paraphrase it, like uh, how uh, one can infer properties about uh, and and like environment of NV centers in diamond from studying the coherence processes uh, of, uh, of of those spin degrees of freedom in NV centers. So uh, the floor, uh, I mean, the screen, the floor is yours, Daniel. Uh, please, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for a very nice introduction. Indeed, I will be talking about the natural environment around NV centers. Uh, but first, maybe I should introduce the group that I'm from. So this is a spin qubit group at the Institute of Physics of Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, the chief, the head of the group is Łukasz Cywiński. Um, um, po first postdoc and uh, only one currently is Piotr Szankowski, who is uh, specialized in reading signal out of noise, uh, as I have written. But uh, I hope it will become slightly clearer what I mean by that in the next slides. Um, there is a PhD student, my, my dear colleague Jan Krzywda, who is, uh, who is currently uh, working on a coherent transport of an electron through s multiple silicon quantum dots. Well, and there is myself, which I hope you will know uh, what I've been doing for the recent almost five years. So I would like to tell you, first of all, as, as it was announced, I won't talk about quantum computers, but I will try to focus on the, the, the topic of quantum sensing, as it's called. Mm, about the nitrogen vacancy center. So please, of course, uh, ask me questions if, if, you, uh, if you don't find it uh, understandable what, what, what is the nature of, of, of this defect. So um, we are talking about diamond, so mostly carbon. There is a defect which is nitrogen vacancy, meaning uh, one of the carbon atoms is substituted by nitrogen and then next neighbor is a vacancy. And it turns out that um, the free electron pair of nitrogen, uh, three electrons from uh, nearest neighbor carbons, and also an electron coming from the lattice uh, creates a sort of a molecule diluted in, in the diamond, which has energy levels which lie between valence and, and uh, conduction band of, of the diamond. And uh, this is extremely lucky that we can actually uh, control this, this, uh, this difference between ground and excited state uh, corresponds really to visible uh, laser. And also interestingly, above the excited state of uh, the triplet excited state of the NV center, we have a continuum of phonon sideband basically, which means that for initialization, we can use a different wavelength than for readout uh, of, of um, nitrogen vac vacancy center state. Um, so, Basically, what, what happens here, um, initialization of, of uh, ground spin state of, of NV center is done by optical pumping. So we first excite um, an, an electron from ground triplet state. We excite it even above, slightly above the uh, level, the, the excited triplet state. And then the electron can go down either uh, radiatively back to uh, triplet A, or through sort of something which is called intersystem crossing, which is basically a um, not allowed transition, so to say, um, from from triplet to singlet, and then 
uh, how is the spin state initialized? Basically, it turns out that probability of uh, going down from the singlet state to ground triplet is much higher for spin state zero, actually twice higher than for state one. So if we continue this process and relaxation passes some, actually it's like 30% of chance going from, from triplet to, to this singlet state, we um, increase polarization, spin polarization of, of ground state of NV center. So what we really want to do by this process we want for our electron to lie down on the ground state, um, spin ground state zero. Um, also, uh, going somehow zooming into this electronic triplet state level, we have spin one system. So we have zero plus one and minus one spin state. There is zero field splitting, which comes from the uh, from the symmetry of uh, of of the of this molecule inside diamond and there is also plus and minus one levels which can be split up by application of external magnetic field mm. spatially what is also interesting for us is the fact that quantization axis of of nv center so this z axis where we would define as z as x and as y operators they uh, z is direction from nitrogen to vacancy Mm. Why is it also a very interesting entity, except for the fact that we can initialize the uh, ground spin state, is also the fact that it's weakly coupled to, to phonons, simply because carbon, nitrogen, they have very low mass. So spin orbit is uh, sort of spin and orbital degrees of freedom are decoupled, uh, one can say. And that's why this is a stable qubit in room temperature. Why do I call it a qubit, you might ask also. Well, it's a spin one system, but by choice of microwave, we define that our qubit is, for example, between zero and minus one state. We drive transitions from zero to minus one, for example. Sorry, Damian, uh, can you uh, elaborate on this last point? Like, what, 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 what chooses the, the qubit? Uh, you mm -hmm. said that the microwave microwave radiation in a sense yes so i will i will pass to the next slide where basically we are concerned about the, the electric for me as a as a theorist you know in in the direction of decoherence i'm really concerned about this uh, ground state not the way how it's initialized and read out which i told you about but the, the fact that we have spin one system and we apply external magnetic field we create splitting between plus and minus one level and then um, you know, what I mean by uh, definition of the qubit is just that we rotate from zero to plus one. We can also, uh, by, by doing resonant Rabi uh, oscillations, we can, we can also create a superposition state between zero and plus one instead of, for example, zero and minus one. Is that a bit clearer now? Mm, sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, like right. just so, sort of by the, uh, it's kind of defined by the way you, you probe the system, basically. By the exactly. Mm -hmm. One exactly. more question I, I, I have. So you mentioned that this quantization axis is directed from the nitrogen to the vacancy. Mm -hmm. And so is this direction uniform across this, uh, in this sample or for different qubits, we have different directions? It would be different. I mean, if you look at the at the symmetry of of the diamond, we can have a different di different directions between nitrogen and vacancy. So, if you think about multiple nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, of course, they can have different uh, directions mm -hmm. in space. This, so, it's, I imagine that it's also. I mean, uh, that uh, that makes uh, like that uh, that makes. Uh, uh, like probing those systems or uh, makes like interacting with those systems like more complicated because in every uh, in every NP center you need to like control the the fields in different uh, direction, right? In a sense, but actually, I mean, uh, some people in experiments actually claim that if you have two NV centers which already have rotated, I mean, mutually rotated quantization axis, mm -hmm. in a sense you can use different frequencies to drive them because you know your magnetic field 
basically gives you a different uh, different value of uh, splitting between plus and minus one for a rotated NV center. Oh, so in a okay. sense, you gain control instead of lose. But, but from my point of view, if I have a coupled uh, pair of NV centers, it's not that great that I have one NV which is looking at a you know um, relatively rotated environment. It's not actually useful to observe uh, spatial correlations, for example, which I mm -hmm. hope I will elaborate. Hmm? Okay. Great. Um, so yes, uh, I mentioned diamond, right? So we have carbon atoms, but uh, carbon nuclei, what is the most important actually. So um, C12 nuclei, they are spinless basically, but C13, they they contain spin they are of spin one half and mm, there is naturally in the diamond you will have 1.1 percent of those guys uh, which are you can say randomly uniformly distributed in the in the diamond lattice which actually makes life very interesting because each nv center by definition will have a different uh, environment Okay, because you have a different random uniform distribution of, of C13 spins around each NV. Okay, so each of those nuclei as of spin one half, they will react to external magnetic fields. So they will have Zeman splitting. Um, and they also interact with each other. Um, here, the most important is the fact that they interact through dipolar interaction. And there is our nitrogen vacancy center, which of course has splitting, as I, as I told you before. And there is interaction of, of nitrogen vacancy center with those C13 nuclei. And this is also a, a dipolar interaction mostly. But please bear in mind that um, if you would have the same distance and the same spatial configuration between two nuclei and between NV center and, uh, and the nucleus, you will already have uh, a ratio of strengths of dipolar interactions as ratio between mass of electron and mass of neutron. So order of a thousand. So in some situations, it will become clear that um, in order to describe the coherence of an NV center, we do not need to include interactions between nuclei. Okay? Mm. And also, uh, something which I didn't really elaborate on, uh, so NV center is also called a deep defect, which means that its electronic wave function is tightly localized around the, the, this molecule, sort of. Um, this is important because they are there are basically two types of interactions you can encounter between uh, electron and nuclei inside such, such systems. For example, in gary Marsonite quantum dots, it, the, something which is called Fermi contact interaction, which is basically proportional to uh, expectation uh, to probability of finding an electron on a nucleus which is interacting with it. In NV, this will be important only for a case when we find one or two nuclei uh, really 0.5 nanometers from, from NV and the lattice constant is order of 0.3. Um, I actually forgot, but uh, you know, this, this order of magnitude so that you know. That's why in most of our works, in order to discuss about the bigger environment, we actually neglect cases where um, we would have a realized special realization where nuclei would be so really so close to 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 NV center. Uh, but in particular experiments, so so does it happen that sometimes it is close actually? That the particular, you know, it may be unlikely, but mm -hmm. sometimes uh, it happens, and then it's. Uh, it's important, I imagine that it's important to include this kind of interaction. Naturally, but the, the thing is that if you, if you find such a case, the, the Fermi contact interaction is really huge compared to dipolar interactions with the others. Mm -hmm. So for me, looking at the signal, you know, sort of global signal, you might call it from the environment, it's sort of producing something which I don't want to look at. It's, it's basically covering the whole signal, yeah. you might think, yeah? Yes. Yeah, sorry, one more question, uh, sure. Damian. Uh, actually, okay, we are, okay, it's about earlier thing, but like how, how is readout realized? This is kind of, I, I miss, uh, like, because <coughs> you represented quite well how the, uh, uh, 
yeah, how you start a qubit, right? But how, mm -hmm. how, how, how do you measure it? Mm, so I will come back to this slide. So this red arrow is shortly speaking, uh, representing readout. Mm. So for example, if, if we do experiments with MVs, we would rotate the qubit to superposition state, then it evolves with the, with the environment causing decoherence, uh, you know. And at some point, we do measurement by rotating the, the qubit back to Z axis, so either zero or plus or minus one state, or I mean, what's left of it, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, doing pi over two rotation on, on the block sphere. And then a readout corresponds to reading out uh, fluorescence, uh, depending on zero or plus minus one state. It turns out that for zero state, for the same reason that, uh, that we were, that I was talking about initialization, you will find more photons for zero state because it's much more likely to go down from, from singlet state to triplet state uh, from this state rather than from plus minus one. Okay, so you will see, first you would, draw, you would perform multiple experiments where you measure uh, supposedly zero state, okay? And then you will do the same with rotated qubit uh, by 180 degrees, okay? And there is a, experimentalist at least uh, would call difference between this and that result as uh, measured, experimentally measured coherence of the qubit. Uh, ah, you mean, co I mean, okay, coherence, but uh, how do you, I mean, okay, but just from fluorescence, you, re uh, yes. you can sort of read out the, the difference like in population between this mm -hmm. excited, I mean, yeah. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. So, I mean, yes. I understand, I understand mm -hmm. that once you have a possibility to manipulate a qubit, you can, and then you have computational basis measurement, then you can do mm -hmm. like tomography, etc. Right, exactly. but uh, just from fluorescence, by the virtue of fluorescence, you have the this uh, computational basis measurement. So exactly. Okay. And so you I count the photons yeah. basically, yes, and some number exactly. means that it's zero, and another number means it's yes, one. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. There is something which is called uh, avalanche photodiode, which is at the end of uh, confocal microscope in the experiment, and you actually count uh, photons which come from NV center. And what is really important, and people try to work around it, is that these photons, well, they come at random direction. So you do not collect everything. You have quite a low efficiency, typically. But some people try to produce diamonds which uh, have a shape of a lens, so that those photons would be a little bit, uh, you know, focused uh, nice. on, on, the, on the dial. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. When I learned about it, I, I really was, you know, excited. So. Um, what I really want to adver advertise here, from experimental point of view, what is important, you use a different wavelength for initialization and for readout. So you can basically, at, uh, at the very end, between uh, avalanche photodiode and the confocal microscope, you can put a filter which just removes photons of this wavelength, of your initialization wavelength. So, you know, quite neat, basically. Hmm? Um, Yes, so we elaborated on the interactions that we have here. Um, so what I, um, how we, in our group, in our spin qubit group, what we think of decoherence is a way of observation of the environment around the qubit. So uh, what you would do, um, except for initialization of zero state that I mentioned, then you know by, by application of, of uh, pi over two pulse, from microwaves, you, you, can, uh, you can create a superposition, and then you wait for, you operate the qubit, it evolves with the environment, and at some point, it's dead. I mean, representation of, of this death on, on, the, on the block sphere is that it's a point inside, which you obviously know. But um, what is, uh, mm, when talking about, uh, you know, energy level structure between uh, nuclei and, and the NV center itself, you, you could probably uh, expect that uh, relaxation, so, you know, evolution of, of these elements of uh, qubit density matrix is much, much slower and on the time scale of decoherence, so, you know, loss of those of diagonal elements, these do not change in time. 
Okay, so it it would correspond to a, a pure dephasing scenario. Um, and yes, there is a time scale when uh, you would not really observe any uh, sort of quantumness from the qubit. So, so this coherence is lost to zero, and this already characterizes the environment that we have. Okay, so um, the simplest possible experiment that you might imagine is exactly um, initialization of superposition weighting and qubits uh, that so loss of coherence is described by i mean my numerical um, simulation of uh, one of the realizations of environment around mv center is this white curve um, and there is a nice fit of exponent to minus t over t2 star squared so this t2 star already um, characterizes uh, partially the environment around NV uh, center. And uh, what it turns out is that um, T2 star, or rather one over T2 star, corresponds to a sum of uh, squares of uh, parallel interactions between nuclei and, and the qubit. So in a sense, it's a very simple uh, thing. You might, you might actually uh, expect that if you would substitute the environment consisting of, of nuclei by a noisy magnet, uh, well, you know, this noise produced by a magnet is described by a sum. I mean, it's like a sub substitution of uh, interactions of uh, nuclei with the qubit uh, and probability distribution of, of this noise is uh, is a gaussian you will get exactly the same result so you know some uh, you you actually can call it uh, inhomogeneous broadening in, in the literature and well it's not very practical to use it to characterize the environment it's just simply a, a you know number so so Damian, people... just a, yes. just a question so this uh mm -hmm. Those parallel interactions, they I understand they depend like they depend on the distance of those uh, mm -hmm. uh, C fourteen uh, uh, car uh, carbons yeah. to uh, to your defect. So it's yes. like so effectively like sort of like an average of all them, all of them, or you do yes. some cutoff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's that's how how it is, and of course we have to remember that dipolar interaction goes like one over r to the uh, one over distance to the third power so you might from from one point of view it doesn't really have a well defined theoretically range right because it's one over r to the third power but on the other hand there is effective size of the of the environment but i will elaborate on that later if i can okay, okay. so um the, the next step that you can make, and I was actually mostly concerned about that, is that uh, initialize, you know, qubit is initialized in superposition, then for half of the total time of evolution it evolves, okay, and then pi rotation around x-axis is applied to the qubit, and then it evolves for, the, for another half of, of the total evolution time. Um, why would you do that? Well, you might think of this rotation, so for a, if this would be such a simple noisy magnet, you actually uh, almost completely remove contribution from, uh, from the effect that I discussed in, on the prior slide. So this simple inhomogeneous broadening is removed. It, some, some people call it as uh, you know, reversing time, sort of, for the second part of the evolution, for, at least for this very simple uh, contribution and you are left with uh, something which tells you a little bit more about uh, interactions. So in prior case, um, the coherence corresponded to some of parallel interactions, parallel with respect to uh, quantization axis of NV centers. But in case of uh, uh, spin echo, coherence can, for example, oscillate as here in the case of uh, 100 Gauss, so that you know there are some limits interesting. and there is a, a case of 1,000 Gauss. So what I have on these uh, curves, um, so this sort of yellowish curve is a numerical uh, simulation. 
and I will describe the method shortly that, that I use here. And there is this, uh, well, what's that color? It's magenta, I think. Yes, it's magenta. So magenta corresponds to uh, approximation that I neglect interactions between nuclei. And in case of 100 Gauss, you have a quite a nice fit between uh, numerical simulation and numerical simulation with assumption that nuclei do not interact with each other. But the, when the field is greater, these become less and less important. So you cannot- uh, sorry, Excuse me, Damian, I, I got a yes. little bit lost with uh, what is sure. this uh, magnetic field? Is it like a uh, external uh, field or uh, yes. what is- uh, Yes, is it's external field. It's, you can think of it as uh, something which basically defines splitting between uh, Aha, both so, so this is like a standard uh, like uh, constant magnetic field which makes you as a mm -hmm. splitting yes that's yes uh, exactly okay. in experiment what what people do you have a diamond you know in in your microscope and yes. on top you have a stage with multiple neodymium small neodymium magnets and you just put them closer and closer and you oh. register if your uh, you know uh, contrast of the signal is growing or not. If it's wow. growing, nice. then it that's, means that your that's... magnet is sort of uh, on axis with NV center. You okay, know, okay, so cool. That's yeah. something like that. Um, yeah. So, Daniel, if I, if I understood, I mean, this I think you didn't say, but hmm? implicitly maybe you had that in mind, is that, okay, those interactions between the, the NV center and, and this buff, they, they have, like, there are many terms there, like some of them are, uh, like, uh, like the, the dominant ones are like correspond to the quantization axis, but there are other ones as far as I understand. And then this the spin echo basically kills off like contributions coming from this uh, parallel. Parallel. Okay. So yes. you you somehow change uh, so to say energy scale, right? Or you like basically look on the part of the dynamics which is completely like effectively absent. Uh, like uh, yes. About it. Okay. So this yes, is... but it's not really. Uh, I mean, it's not really that uh, those uh, I will call them transverse uh, interactions with respect to quantization axis that they have different energy scale than parallel. But those parallel are the most important uh, when I don't control the qubit. That's the case. Okay. Sure, so, sure, sure. so energy scales are. I mean, can so be, it's, I'm so talking about like energy scale, right? like. Sure, sure. That was just like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. mental shortcut. For the okay. Yeah. okay, great. Great. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, what's, what's the most important information to take here is that in high magnetic fields, here it's, okay, 1000 Gauss, maybe doesn't sound familiar, but 0.1 Tesla should, so that's the same value, basically. And then it, the de decoherence, which you might observe in experiment, will correspond to uh, introduction of interactions between uh, nuclei, at least in theoretical description. So how do we do that? Um, so effectively, at least from my numerical simulations, I know that for natural diamond, the size of the, of the bath around uh, NV center, so number of those C13 nuclei, is order of, I don't know, 400, 600 spins, something like that. So, of course, it's not easy to, uh, to calculate the coherence with 600 spins directly. Mm. So, oh yes, okay. I, I, should, I already actually told what's, what's on this slide, so I will continue. What we do, we think of the fact that correlations inside the nuclear bath, they form on a finite time scale. So, uh, let's say we have two nuclear spins and with the values of the interactions, you know that it would take time for them to discuss with each other. So, you know, to correlate in a sense. So on short time scales, relatively short time scales, you don't need to introduce interactions between nuclei. At some point, only pairs of nuclei discuss, okay? And then it takes another correlation time defined for this system to, to, to have three spin correlations, which become important. So, uh, other, in other words, the longer the coherence takes, the more, the higher order correlations inside the bath we can register in decoherence. okay? This is called cluster correlation expansion, by the way. If you like, there are references below. Um, 
Um, so if you look uh, once again at the coherence um, at uh, here actually 3000 Gauss or 0.3 Tesla, you will find out that, as I said, uh, description of uh, by you know non-interacting bath is not uh, not relevant here. This is called CCE1. So description when uh, nuclei are not interacting with each other. CCE2 corresponds to a fact that we have pairs of nuclei which uh, uh, which form correlations, and these become important. This is the um, the oscillating and decaying curve here. But if I start uh, in simulation, if I start thinking about the uh, three spin or four spin correlations in, in the bath, well, we don't need to introduce them. So in a sense, in such conditions, on, on the level at least of, uh, you know, at least up to, uh, it's, it's actually clearer here, up to 1% of coherence, it is not really uh, interesting to think about three or four spin correlations. So our bath is described by uh, per clusters of nuclear spins, in a sense. Um, so, so yes. can, I, can I ask something more? I mean, let's yes. say about physics. So uh, as far as I understand, like the like energy scales of all this problem, they are like given. Okay, there are many things there, but like there is like strength of magnetic field. Uh, and another thing is like how how many uh, those C13 uh, carbons you've got there? Is there a way to like I imagine that if you could if you had for some reason more of those uh, C13 uh, maybe it's a stupid question C13 uh, like uh, nucleus there there then like it would change the like energy scale of the problem right? Uh, so do, do, are, is it possible to control this? Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so you can have uh, artificial uh, diamonds, in a, artificial in a sense that you enrich them with uh, C13 or not. Mm -hmm. uh, of mm -hmm. course, if you would think about uh, decoherence as uh, mm, something which does not help, but uh, you don't have a good quantum computer on the timescales that you want. You, of course, want to remove C13 nuclei, and people successfully okay. removed them to the order of the of 0.01 percent. Okay, so uh, actually even more, as far as I know, these are some uh, you know um, material scientists from uh, from Japan that that do that very nicely. Okay. As well. So when, when people want to, because I understand that your motivation is that you want to understand what is the environment, what is the structure of environment of, uh, of the energy center, but from the, yeah, uh, yeah, from the other side, when people want to use uh, those uh, degrees of freedom for quantum information processing, they, they would do what, what you described. Yes, they would want to control that. That's exactly okay. true. Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, in, in not ideal world, you can also want to search uh, through your diamonds that you have in the lab and find the nicest <laughs> spatial, uh, you know, uh, structure. And well, that's what happened in Delft quite recently. They gained control over uh, 12 nuclear spins. They claim that they can uh, look at a cluster of two, three spins, for example. But if they want, they look at a single spin only. By, by, by control. And yeah, that was actually a, a lucky thing to find such a diamond in the lab. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so what I uh, already mentioned, um, we have dipolar interactions which uh, basically govern the system that we're talking about. So you don't have well-defined range of the interaction, but from numerical point of view, if I would include more nuclear spins around NV center, then, you know, drawn on this uh, sphere, let's call it a sphere, but it's actually, you know, circle, it wouldn't change the coherence curve. So that's how I define nuclei that interact with the qubit to give a whole decoherence picture as it's written here. And there is an area quite close by the, the NV center, um, which gives sort of fingerprints of strongly coupled nuclei. So if you would look at spin echo decoherence, on those uh, high magnetic field values, as I called this, you will see um, some oscillations in the coherence. And if you artificially remove 
a greater and greater area around NV center at some point. So, so those oscillations get weaker and at some point they simply disappear and you have bell-shaped, uh, you know, the coherence curve. Yeah. So this is, as you may imagine, characteristic for each and every NV center, of course, because it depends on this uh, random distribution of, of C13. Mm. What is also interesting, uh, what people do to describe experiments when they apply multiple pulses, uh, you can do some something which you may call noise spectroscopy. But it's easier to understand what this, uh, how do you do this noise spectroscopy with qubits if you don't think about NV or some uh, spin qubit interacting with nuclei which interact with each other, but you substitute the bath by uh, a noise which is interacting parallel to Z axis of the qubit. Um, so in such case, coherence corresponds to average of realizations of this stochastic uh, potential, uh, some integral, which I will describe shortly. But as you may remember from stochastic uh, theory, if this process was, uh, okay, if this process was Gaussian, this average, you know, average over e2 minus i x corresponds to e2 minus x squared average, right? So actually it corresponds to second cumulant if uh, noise is zero on average. Um, here you have f of t inside the integral. This integral is over total time of evolution. f of t corresponds to something which is called in, uh, in theory as a filter function and it changes sign whenever you apply pi pulse to, to the qubit. And something which is uh, also developed uh, in, in other uh, theoretical groups is that you do not need to uh, assume that this pi pulse is instantaneous, as I have uh, drawn here. So you have, you know, here is just a jump from, from one to minus one, but it can be continuous. And it's also a question how important it is to introduce uh, the fact that it's actually not instantaneous, this, this pulse. Mm. But if you assume that the noise uh, created by the bath is Gaussian and stationary, and this E2 minus chi describes the, the, the whole thing, and chi corresponds to uh, an integral over noise spectral density so something which basically characterizes the bus. So we get back to description of frequencies characteristic for, uh, for, for, the, for the nuclear bus and uh, modulus square of uh, Fourier transform of this filter function. So here you have this modulus square of the filter function written. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about applicability of this you know, Gaussian stationary uh, description of the noise, why and when can you do that? Well, Piotr Shankowski is a specialist to, to ask about that. Mm, but uh, at least in my, uh, in my work, many times I have come back to the question when this description by a Gaussian, not always classical, but at least Gaussian process, uh, we can substitute the whole description of, you know, uh, microscopic description of, of the nuclear bath. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, one of the works actually which I find the most interesting uh, from uh, when the time passed by, which I did, was uh, talking about a polarized nuclear bath around the NV center. So normally, as I mentioned, experiments are done in room temperature. So thermal density matrix of nuclear spins in room temperature would correspond to completely mixed uh, density matrix, but um, people uh, by by control of single nuclear spins uh, really close to to NV center, they can create they can sort of transfer polarization from NV center to some nuclei and artificially create a situation where some spins have polarization on the order of one, so they have uh, 
sort of a quantum state, okay? They are no longer completely mixed. And there is um, other part of the bath which is still completely mixed. So the, the other case, which I think is a little bit more complicated, if you increase magnetic field for some time to really huge values and also decrease the temperature to cryogenic temperatures, you will gain natural polarization, this you know, thermal polarization of the bath. If you look at the thermal density matrix, you will of course find out that polarization is this hyperbolic tangent of uh, you know, inverse temperature times the Zeeman splitting, which corresponds of course to applied magnetic field. So the higher field, the lower temperature, you can create that. But as I have written here, in this case, all of the spins observed by NV are polarized, but only by 1%. Here, you have a few, few tens of spins which are fully polarized. And personally, I find this uh, scenario on the left-hand side a little bit more interesting. So, um, what you would like to uh, hear probably as a, as a simple explanation of uh, what changes when the bath is partially polarized is a case when uh, decoherence is a product of uh, coherence uh, when polarization is not present times some phase which comes from polarized spins or, or from the polarization itself. Um, so what was redefined sort of, or maybe it's still a, a the present definition, what is Gaussian, or how, so the environment is Gaussian where expansion of, of these terms can be terminated Cumulant expansion can be terminated at second order. And if you look at the, um, you know, interaction, uh, the coupling operator of the bus uh, in, uh, um, uh, in interaction picture, sorry, um, this uh, real part, this E to minus chi, would correspond to an average over anti-commutator of uh, coupling operator at two different times and phase which comes from non-polarized spins, would correspond to a commutator at two different times. So if you look at this already, and we come back to thinking of a classical process described by a number, well, you would already expect that this phase phi g is not present when the noise is described by a classical process because, well, commutator of two numbers is zero, right? So. Uh, that's something that we are looking for, uh, or not. Let's see. Mm. Uh, isn't it not the same in uh, <coughs> description of um, uh, NMR, what is usually called as memory function? You, if you have first space, which you mentioned, you can reduce the relaxation processes just to one relaxation time. And if you have a complex relaxation time, which is memory function, then you need a phase, which also depends in some complicated way of underlying processes. Is it not the same description? Um, to be honest, it's hard for me to relate to that. I mean, it's the first time I've heard about it, I must shamefully <laughs> say. So I will have to check on that. But it uh, could be the same, but I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you can have a complex number in classical NMR in this case. Oh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> but it's present when you polarize the uh, molecules or something? Uh, well, you, 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 you do just spin echo, spin echo experiment, but that all depends of environment. In, in the first case, which you showed on the previous slide, you are mm -hmm. pumping spin polarization with optical uh, light, yes? With, with, yes. With photons. In the second case, you polarize everything. You assume that this is, um, I don't know, adiabatic or non-adiabatic process. You go with magnetic field to infinity. So <clears throat> because of uh, energy consideration, one spin state is uh, much more likely than another one, yes? Mm -hmm. But in the certain case, besides all the side effect, because you will also split electronic levels, which makes uh, other complications, not very much can happen. In the first case, the spin system can evaluate 
on some interesting and complex way. But this is what people of NMR doing with spin echoes, and they have a, a very sophisticated techniques to rotate mm -hmm. those uh, spins, correlate them, made so-called magic angle spinning experiments, which depend mm -hmm. on the natural symmetries of the system as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. I see. But it would still, this uh, imaginary part at least, would correspond to a case when we polarize uh, observed entity or, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, okay, okay, so that's, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this I would expect, yes, sure. I mean, okay, but it's interest, I mean, I'm by no means as expert in all those things, but it's very cool physics. Uh, but last time when, when Lukas was uh, giving us outline of the things that he is interested in, he uh, underlined this, this space exactly and this uh, commutator that somehow uh, appears here. I, as far as I remember, and like he, he emphasized that it's like different than uh, okay. That I mean, at least that it's okay. So it's no, it's good to know that it appears in other contexts. Then it's, it's uh huh. Yes, uh, for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, it's really lovely when when the case, especially of NV centers and carbons, you know, and the whole field of uh, sort of quantum sensing is actually around mm, rederiving or borrowing techniques from uh, existing NMR to classical, oh sorry, to, to this sort of quantum NMR, you might call it, or nano NMR, whatever. But, but yeah, for sure, there are plenty of groups which, uh, which think of it directly. Uh, that's why I also mentioned that this filter function it does not have to be sharp, you know, going from plus one to minus one, but it's actually useful to look at continuous uh, continuously going from one to the other or applying more pi pulses not always uh, at the same uh, you know period of time so not always uh, resonantly but um, it turns out that during my almost five years of study I didn't really uh, discuss I, I did some ex uh, some sort of simulations but I actually didn't uh, work on multiple pi pulses, which is a, a, a different thing. I can, I can talk about this uh, later, I, I know a bit, let's say, but I think uh, the time is sort of running out, right? I mean, I can so, talk so, as long as you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are like relaxed, but of course, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, like the form of the seminar, but probably one shouldn't extend it like for like, okay, maybe, 10 minutes more is the maximum, maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. sure, sure. But I mean, then we can I, I don't discuss to to later. Oh, for sure. Of course, sure. yeah. In a, like, uh, even less formal way. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Mm, so, um, yeah, let me, let me come to some point and then we can, we can discuss uh, further on. Um, so about uh, what I mentioned, this uh, sort of more interesting case of dynamic nuclear polarization. Uh, so I was um, simulating this case for uh, moderate magnetic fields. So when the interactions between nuclei are not important, at least in this work. Um, so what we find, what what, uh, what experimentalists typically look at uh, is actually expectation value of of sigma x for the qubit. Uh, but they also almost every time try to say that it's exactly modulus of, of coherence, which is not always true, as we will find out. But uh, yeah, in this moderate field, we, we would expect, even without polarization, that we will have drops and coming back of, of, the, of the coherence. So drops and revivals, I should uh, formally say. When we look at the phase sitting at this e2 minus i uh, phi, Mm, what we will find out that if if we have nuclear spins which are uh, very close to NV centers and NV center and they are polarized, sometimes this phase uh, can be really can get a really high value, and this this high value actually uh, corresponds to a moment where modulus of coherence is almost dropping to zero. So not exactly when it is zero here, but at this no, on the verge of being zero. Um, yes, 
And if I artificially remove once again this strongly coupled region, uh, so uh, let's claim that all of the spins are uh, highly polarized, but still uh, they are far away, then uh, I, I can use a simplified description. So normally what I would do in uh, cluster correlation expansion, I would say that full coherence corresponds to product of contributions which correspond to one minus delta w uh, for each and every nuclear spins if, if they do not interact with each other so yeah this cc1 then um, this value can be really low of course if uh, nuclear spins interact weakly with with nv then this product of one minus delta w can be uh, approximated by exponent of minus sum of contributions. And this is easily translated to uh, exponent of minus chi, okay? This is some, some real part. And exponent of minus i, some phase term, okay? So this imaginary part. Um, if, I, if the bath, uh, the nuclear spins, would be described uh, by Gaussian approximation, I would also have to assume that well, this is, sounds weird, but if you think about uh, expansion of uh, sines and cosines, this becomes a little bit clearer. Uh, total time of uh, observations of this x-axis here on the, on the plots uh, for each spin should be much smaller than twice uh, Zeeman splitting over transverse coupling to, to, the, to the NV center squared for all of the nuclei. Um, so, Okay, how it emerges in, in the simulation? If I look at longer time scales, this uh, greenish curve, which corresponds to uh, assumption that all of the spins correspond to Gaussian description, it's getting worse and worse over time, right? It's, it diverges a bit and it diverges more on longer time scale, okay? Okay, when the bath can be described by Gaussian, so, First, uh, first thing on the, on the top, presented on the top, is modulus of coherence. And it has been found in the literature before that if the, if the nuclear bath can be described by Gaussian environment, then modulus to the fourth power of coherence for NV center, uh, but the qubit defined between zero and one state, should be equal to coherence of uh, NV center qubit defined between one and minus one level. And uh, well, this fourth power might not uh, feel clear, but it actually turns out that um, E to minus chi for both of those definitions of the qubit is also multiplied in the exponent uh, by difference of uh, spin numbers between which the qubit is defined. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I have one minus minus one squared, I get the fourth power. Okay? Mm -hmm. What we found is another condition. If you look at the face, which is this uh, part of it, sort of imaginary, uh, no, it's not the, the imaginary part, it's, it's the face of, of coherence. It's zero for qubit defined between one and minus one when it can be described by Gaussian. And in the simulation, it turns out that even if I remove the, quite a lot of strongly coupled nuclear spins, this phase still slightly oscillates and it oscillates stronger the longer uh, total evolution time. So the, again, Gaussian description is getting worse on longer time scales that we, that we look at the, at the bath, okay? So it's sort of a nice, nice condition, you might think, if, especially in the experiment, if you want to compare something to zero, it's better than to just compare difference between two curves. I can imagine, but I don't know that for sure. I guess I will learn in the next years. But uh, yes, that's... Uh, but, uh, but isn't it the case, like, if you go to the... Like, that for some processes, like, uh, you don't see the difference, but for some other, you do, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the problem is you have a lot of, uh, you know, counting, uh, photon counting noise. And you can, uh, you can claim that, uh, you know, difference between two curves corresponds to, uh, you know, this difference that I show here in numerics in theory, but it actually corresponds to, to you know, 
uh, noise coming from photons. I mm -hmm. guess you can you can also uh, extract this information, but I, I think you know difference from zero is better than difference between two curves. Mm -hmm. Only thing I wanted to say here. Okay. So um, yeah, the final final result in in this uh, paper was that. Uh, Okay, as I mentioned in experiment, you have a lot of curves here, but I will really uh, want you to look at uh, something which, which is discussed as experimental result, sort of. Uh, so it's the expectation value of sigma x or sigma y. First of all, if the expectation value of sigma y for the qubit is zero, then you don't have any polarized nuclear spins in the, in the buff, because uh, this expectation value of, of sigma y uh, really can observe only something which comes from from the phase term. Um, yeah. Also, in in sigma x, which is typically observed in the non-polarized buds, um, so not only you can see that the coherence is dropping and rising in the conditions that I discuss here. But when you have strongly coupled nuclei with non-zero polarization, you can observe these extra teeth around the, the curve. Maybe I, I will show you with, the, with my um, arrow here what I mean by that, okay? Those two things. And you might think, okay, this is some artifact. But I actually found a paper uh, where people from Australia doing some, uh, uh, some slightly more complicated pulse sequences with the qubit, something which is called CPMG. Uh, they do uh, polarize nitrogen on NV center and uh, they say, okay, we see drops and revivals of coherence with some conditions, whatever, but they also see these teeth, okay? And they couldn't, uh, they couldn't say where does it come from. So I actually will uh, contact them once again with, with those results and we will try to discuss if this is exactly the effect that they've seen. So basically presence of strong, of fully polarized uh, nitrogen on NV center. So basically on the location of the qubit gives you these extra drops, okay? Mm. Maybe I should also mention that uh, in this paper from Delft that I mentioned that they, they can control 12 or 14, I think, uh, nuclear spins around NV center, uh, when they talk about control of, let's say two or three nuclear spins, they control them and observe or measure by looking at sigma y of NV center exactly. So non-zero signal in controlled environment in their experiment corresponds to observation of a given nuclear spin or a pair of spins, yeah? So this is already used in the experiment that non-zero expectation value of sigma y corresponds to uh, something happening with polarized spins. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, maybe this I will uh, remove. This I've already mentioned. If I may use uh, five minutes of your time. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So something around the polarized uh, nuclear spins is the fact that uh, if you have any any sort of polarization inside the bath, you can observe uh, qubit environment entanglement and actually you can elaborate an experiment or discuss the experiment uh, where you initialize zero state of the of the NV center and wait for some time then you apply pi over to um, pulse to create a superposition or something like a superposition inside the block sphere actually at this time. No, actually on, on the block sphere at this time. Then you wait for some time, you measure coherence. Then you do almost the same experiment, but you start with uh, initial one state of the qubit and you look at the difference of coherences. If it's non-zero, you uh, some of the environmental spins uh, are entangled with the qubit. Mm. So yeah, that's that's when, one of the but results. When exactly, but when they are entangled in the course of this evolution, or yes, in yes, of, in the course of this evolution, yes, indeed, it's actually you. What is the most important uh, stage is that zero state in case of NV center. It corresponds to 
multiplying uh, coupling by zero. So sort of uh, NV center at this time is not interacting with, with the spins and in this case it is interacting. And this difference can cause, uh, can cause entanglement. There is a condition derived by my supervisor and our collaborator from Wrocław, Katarzyna Roszak, uh, which actually corresponds, you know, to this, uh, mm, let's call it, uh, Gedanken experiment, yeah? Um, going further, but I will really shortly uh, advertise, this was one of the most interesting uh, uh, applications of, of these polarized spins that I had been thinking of, quantum Darwinism, but yeah, if you, uh, so, so think about the, the, the other case. We have air particles which, let's say, are described by, they, by their direction in space, and there is a book, and they scatter of the book, uh, let's say there is there is no dissipation on the way. Okay, so they simply change direction after scattering, uh, which would be described by the change of state of those guys if state is a, as I said, direction in space. Now, uh, I take the same number of uh, air particles and I only rotate my book. Okay, they once again come from those directions. Remember, it's only a Gedanken experiment, okay? It's not uh, <laughs> directly, but, but okay, it's, it's a nice idea. So you just rotate the book, Th those, those uh, molecules uh, once again scatter off. So in this angle of scattering, you have uh, angle of, uh, respective angle of rotation of the book inside the state. And if you want to uh, take a look at how different is the state of the environment after scattering when I only, uh, when I have the same initial state of air particles, but I just rotate the book, it turns out that the more air particles we have, the more orthogonal those states of environment become. And this is really a very neat example, I think, of something which is called uh, um, environmentally induced super selection. And, uh, something which is discussed, uh, you know, as application of decoherence by Wojciech Żurek, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, quantum physicists of those times, what some people might say. Um, something uh, which comes together with that, uh, so if I have a real state of environment... Well, if I can maybe comment, so this, this, yes, ex yes. this exposition was kind of neat, but of course it's a bit like a very pictorial way because it's sure. like what you're describing here is like a purely classical process like i mean you use brackets yes. to talk about yes. it but you could have like it could have been just like an ensemble of like uh, classical particles as well, yes right? and you'll have similar kind of behavior I, I would say. yes yes but it's also of course nice that you can expect some you can try to expect that in in the quantum case right um but but yeah it's i, I think it's a nice picture just to understand mm -hmm. the big names the big words of you know a quantum darwinism and stuff like that uh, so except for the condition that we will have at some okay we have okay, let's come back to the, the the sort of real world we have qubits and we have some fraction of the environment that we will call part of the environment that we can observe, okay? Mm, so at some point, if you look at only the state of the qubit, because of the whole environment, it's already dead. So if you trace out the whole environment, the coherence is lost. But if you look at, if you trace out only fraction of an environment that you are not observing, there is a point of time that not only the coherence happens, but also states of the fraction of observed environment uh, conditioned on the state of the qubit, so zero or one, they become at some point orthogonal, or at least it's a condition that we want to have. Uh, in a sense, you may think of it as uh, emergence of objectivity. Uh, if you choose another fraction and another fraction of the environment and ask the same question. If, it, if you know, I, I kind of liked one of the, so on my, I, I will tell a short story and I will finish, okay? So on my first grade, when I was in a conference in Wrocław, uh, I think uh, Professor Paweł Chorodecki 
uh, show the slide when you know this can be described i mean philosophically by a case when you're passing by a paddle and you accidentally put your foot on it then you know at some point the paddle is no longer wet it's completely dry but and your foot is not there but you left your footprint and it's in a sense that the qubit left a footprint i was here yeah this is uh, something i i kind of like to to tell us a story mm -hmm. so yeah I, I would finish here maybe maybe i can show some oh. some result okay if if it's if it's uh, kind of important so for nv center and those uh, and a fraction of the environment which is completely polarized we find that it takes 10 spins which are completely polarized to observe formation of spectrum broadcast structures in nv centers uh, without application of multiple pulses mm. so yeah it's uh, it's i think it's a good point to to finish i guess it's been quite a lot by the way but yeah uh, yes thanks uh, a lot uh, damian uh, yeah for the nice talk we have uh, yeah some time for questions comments i did ask a bunch of questions so please maybe yeah others can yeah uh, so I have a question. Uh, at some point, you told us that there are like two interesting models of uh, like uh, if the environment is polarized, like the partially polarized mm -hmm. path, right, and the whole stuff is polarized, As, mm -hmm. right. So the question is, uh, like from the perspective when people want to use uh, those NV centers as actual like you know quantum devices, uh, what is like the most popular scenario uh, in reality? <laughs> Hmm. Well, what they do this actually, is, right? So the, it com of course it completely depends on what you would like to do with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, the the simplest uh, way to say is that, for example, nuclei naturally have much slower dynamics than electrons. So sure. at some point, if you create a fully polarized state of and of nuclei they will lose this polarization on much, much longer time scale than a qubit. So if you do operations on multiple qubits, let's say you have some interesting state, some information, and you might want to transfer it to those nuclei, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying not a nucleus, but nuclei, because, well, of course, you in, in quantum information, you are interested in correlated states of multiple qubits. So you also need multiple qubits to transfer that information to them. You know, something something sure. like that. Other way, you might think of realization of a quantum computer by only NV centers, as you know, those uh, themselves without exploiting a nuclei, maybe yeah. except for nitrogen. And then you want to, as I mentioned before, uh, have a much, much, much lower concentration of, uh, of nuclei, of the C13 nuclei, um, and their distribution you cannot really a control not always at least uh, but then there is a problem uh, which comes up experimental problem or rather fabricational problem is that there is a very hard way to control where do you put NV center in diamond mm -hmm. you create that by uh, putting an ionized beam of nitrogen uh, nitrogen plus to diamond and you know there is some energy of this ionized beam and depending on this energy, you have some depth that you can throw your nitrogen inside. And also you need some energy to remove the neighbor to have a nitrogen and a vacancy as a pair. There are different defects that you can create there. For example, something which is called P1 center, and I might be working on it for the next two years on my postdoc, let's see. Uh, but this is just nitrogen and there you don't have uh, control over quantization axis or rather you don't have a well-defined quantization axis this electron inside nitrogen is jumping and it's changing the, the energy structure is sort of depending on the Jan Teller effect and I have to read a, more, a, little, a little bit more about it but yeah you cannot always control position where you throw a nitrogen vacancy inside the diamond Right. There was a work where you have a linear um, um, grid of NV centers, but it's a nice picture because, of course, it's a plane that you choose for it. 
that there is one direction where it was still undefined. Okay, so <laughs> something like that. Yeah, plenty of things oh. you can do, and of course you oh. can do nano NMR. Hmm? You can put a molecule on top. Sorry, I just just want to finish. Some one of the greatest, in my opinion, applications is that you put a molecule on top of the diamond and you have an NV center which is not very deep in the diamond so it can still sense the molecule and by control of NV center or multiple NV centers in the future I guess you you are able to look at molecular dynamics hopefully at some point in time now mm -hmm. you can see that it exists there you can see protons mm -hmm. present inside the inside the protein for example yeah right or, or nitrogen so quite Quite amazing again. Sure. Yeah. Uh, nice. Uh, any more questions, comments to Damian? So, I I have two actually. One is the quick one. So regarding this spectrum broadcast structure. So when you don't have uh, when you don't do spin echo, do you uh, you don't observe this kind of behavior? Do you need spin echo to? Oh, that, I'm really sorry. I didn't mention in case of spin broadcast structure, we are we were talking actually about not applying spin echo. I was not I was applied. doing yes, yes. It's just okay. this free evolution. So sorry about not mentioning that. I see. With yeah. with interactions between or without without interactions. Uh, uh, so at least on the time scale, you 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 might see here that fidelity, which is a measure of formation of spectrum broadcast structure, drops to well zero, to orders of one to maybe ten microseconds, mm -hmm. and this order of of time uh, tells us that we do not need to include interactions between nuclei. And I also checked that because for mm -hmm. fully polarized spins, you can uh, you can use the same uh, cluster correlation expansion uh, for fidelity because uh, you know fidelity uh, for a group of spins is the product of contributions still it's it you can have like you know uh, yeah something okay. like this hmm? so one more question but connected to the, your comments earlier so when it comes to more like uh, large scale quantum information processing, I don't know, applications, quantum computing, who, know, who knows? What is the greatest bot like experimental bottleneck uh, for, for, uh, to, to scale up those systems? Mm -hmm. So um, first thing is that, uh, so if we want to use for, for quantum information processing, nuclear spins around NV center, one of the greatest bottlenecks is that uh, at the at the current time the this dynamic nuclear polarization so creation of polarized states of nuclei is on the order of i don't know th maybe 13 nuclear spins that's quite a little number right and it's really hard to access spins which are a little bit further from nv center people what people do currently they uh, drive a nuclear spin which is close to uh, NV center first, and then by application of radio frequency, they start talking to another nuclear spin, uh, sort of you know med mediating the interaction between this uh, this nuclear spin. But it's a it's a way where people go. This technique has been published uh, last year actually, and I hope I will be, I will be part of it. <laughs> so that's one of the directions to have more polarized spins. Um, if you think about multiple NVs, as I said, the main problem is lack of actual lack of control of place where you put your NV center uh, around, and also creation of other defects which kill coherence. Uh, you know, other electrons. Mm -hmm. You know, this uh, interaction is much stronger because it's well, electron and electron instead of electron and nucleus. So, yeah, yeah that's I think the biggest uh, experimental challenge and one final thing which is always uh, beating up is uh, that the as i said photons uh, coming from nvs they don't have a well given direction okay by by nature in a sense so they come randomly and you don't count everything so you lose quite a lot a bit of information but you can have a lensed diamond which um, 
can give you a, a better situation with respect to that. Mm -hmm. And also a problem with the fact that electronics is responding at a finite time. So if you want to create a very fast, almost instantaneous microwave pulse, you also mm -hmm. send electric noise. And you come back to a problem that noise causes decoherence, and you come back to square one. So you know, it's, uh, it's also a challenging thing. But you have also a, a very physical problem. If you shorten your microwave pulse very much, then it broadens in frequency, which means mm -hmm. you're in sure. other, other, uh, other spins. Yes. Are... Yes, of course. Of course. Right. Right, so I mean, I, I, as far as I know, the, the, those NVs, they are probably, people don't seriously think that there will be quantum computer. I'm not sure, maybe in, maybe in Australia, they do with NV centers, I don't remember. But like, uh, okay, but they will be for sure useful for some other things, like sensing as you described. So if you ask about the name of a grant that people have applied for, probably you might find that they will be quantum computers. <laughs> but uh, realistically speaking, okay. uh, they yes, they, th this would be mostly used for uh, processing or transferring information, yeah. or uh, or for sensing. Yeah. And actually, sure. I personally believe mostly in sensing and also maybe in quantum simulation. If we have more and more nuclear spins to control, maybe. Mm -hmm. We can also sort of, you know, simulate what happens with with molecules, uh, some some chemical stuff. But mm -hmm. this probably is much more promising in electrically controlled uh, quantum dots, mm, which is a different uh, part of socks, in a sense. Okay. All right then. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I mean, last chance to ask something to Damian. Uh, Okay, if not, let us thank uh, him again for, for his time and for a very nice talk. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.